Bill Moyers, believe it or not. This is my oldest son, Cope. The ride we've just taken down from the High Rockies is part of this week's journal. It's part of the story of a man whose love for his family, this mountainous country, and those husky dogs makes him a unique figure in the eternal struggle of selfhood against mobism. Join me as we meet Stuart Mace. <laughs> This is Toklat, 12 miles northwest of Aspen, Colorado, 10,000 feet above sea level in the Rockies. In Eskimo, the word means a valley formed by a glacier, as Toklat was millions of years ago. This is where, in 1947, Stuart Mace chose to live, and where, with his wife, four sons, and a daughter, he built this home from timber and stone taken from the valley. He came to these mountains to raise his children close to nature and because here he would be able to keep his huskies. During the Second World War, Stuart Mace had been in charge of Arctic survival, and the dogs he trained to rescue downed American flyers became friends he wanted to keep for life. Anybody home down here? Oh, it's nice and warm and toasty. Come on. Come on, big shot. That's a boy. Come on, here's my big shot. Come on. Come on, big shot. Come on, these men won't hurt you. No. Now, here's a big, healthy guy who has no basic problems in the, in the world at the moment, uh, except the worming we're going to have to do in another week. But uh, this is a big Malamute litter. The mother's a medium-large Malamute, and the father's a very, very large one. So you see the broad skull, the thick face even in the puppy uh, that denotes a, a Malamute, which is your Alaskan-type dog. They have a sense of community, these animals do. I mean, they belong, they all belong here. They all have been raised here. They all have worked here. You have everything from the little guys just arriving to the grandpas, but they're all one. And you can see the calmness of this cookie here. Couldn't you even stir a little bit and show a little enthusiasm about getting scratched and petted? How about it? We have a paw first. Huh? Now you want this to spread, huh? You see, now, there's jealousy. Mamalik in Eskimo means noisy, one who mouths off too much. And uh, 
he was given that from a young pup because he was the noisy one to litter. He had m too much to say. And he's jealous because I'm petting Nick. Is that right? You want a some? You want a little TLC? You do. Well, you got it in your porch with some TLC. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You bet. Yeah. This fellow's name is Kerblunik. See they, the big white eyebrows? Well, the word Kerblunik in Eskimo means white eyebrows, therefore means white man. Because the first men to make contact with the Eskimos were the Norsemen, who had the big, bushy, white eyebrows. So that's Kerblunik. That's the father of that brat over there. And he's almost as much a brat as the son. This is Lika. Lika has a beautiful blue eyes. And Lika in Eskimo means ice. And he has the ice blue eyes. And uh, he's a very sensitive guy. A little later on, we'll talk more about lead dogs, especially when you see him work and and what makes a good lead dog and and why all the storybooks are full of baloney. Lead dogs aren't what the books have cracked them up to be, are they, Lika? No. I met Stuart Mace three years ago and soon realized that for him, animals are only a part of the living world. For him, nature is a whole, and man's joy is to live in harmony with it. He devotes much of his time to sharing with students from Aspen the lessons he has himself learned from nature. There's an old saying that they use in connection with some kinds of birds. They talk about fouling their nests. They dirty their nests up so they don't keep them clean, so they have to build a new nest and each year move on. Well, now, if you're interested in nature, if you want to understand what it can mean to you as an individual, or mean to all of us as a society of people, you have to understand that we cannot keep fouling our nests. We cannot keep covering the green land. And we cannot keep shoving the wild animals farther and farther away from us because they are, they are a very part of the reason that we are here at all. These green leaves purify our air. These green leaves and these green plants produce the only basic food produced. Man is incapable of producing food without the aid of green plants. All right, it's as simple as that if you want to get down to the core basics of it. We can't even keep the simple chemistry of life going if we do not set aside, if we do not protect, if we do not take care of natural portions of the world. Because all you have to do is walk up four blocks and you've got a start of, of pollution, which if, if anybody told me when I came to Aspen 25 years ago that we were going to have a pollution problem or that I'd have to wait 10 minutes to cross Main Street, uh, you know, I, I would have laughed at them. And it's becoming geometric now so that you all can see it's conceivable that within the next 10 or 15 years, this group sitting here could see this turned in to a dried up housing development, except that one person gave this in perpetuity. This cannot be destroyed. I'd like to read chants or legends from the Taos Indians. This was our land, the land that the mountain needed in order to rise in majesty, the land that my people needed in order to roam its secrets in reverence. This was the land of our great waters, the beating heart of nature flowing through time. This was our land the land that provided everything good for my people. The land was always our land, and the sun set upon it. The rain washed it, and the fire was kind in its fury. It was so for all time. Then the land was taken from us. It's your land. Do you know how to speak to the land, my brother? Do you listen to what it tells you? Can you take from it no more than what you need. Can you keep its secrets to yourself? Sell the land, my brother? 
you might as well sell the sun and the moon and the stars. You understand best how Stuart Mace expresses this reverence for nature in the winter as he and the young men who work with him take visitors higher into the Rockies on sleds pulled by the Huskies, sleds Stuart Mace himself fashioned from rawhide and hickory. In January, my 14-year-old son and I joined him for a two-day venture. New snow had fallen the night before the journey began, and the dogs, moved by some ancient instinct for the challenges of weather and work, were ready for the harness. These last two dogs going in are younger and with less discipline, so we wait till everybody's loaded and ready, and then we put them in. Why do you like it up here so much? Well, just look around you. The biggest problem as I see it with myself and with with other people that I know well is a constant battle with my ego. And I think this country is a, one of the greatest ego busters uh, that's that's going. How can you how can you have an overinflated ego when you work every day in this kind of country? You know, the, uh, the mountains cut man down to his proper size, I think. This is one of the, the things I get out of it, I think, more than anything else, is the, the co constant uh, reminder that of where I belong, where I fit in the pattern of things. Isn't this beautiful in here? You couldn't, We've you another couldn't, world. Des couldn't design a uh, frosty forest any better than this. There's a tremendous satisfaction um, out of out of challenging without destroying the natural world. We've we've tried not to leave any marks on this land. Let's get this team up a little bit. Hey! As far as I can can see it, man's the only the only animal that's gotten fully out of tune with the basic laws of of the living world. Uh, Namely, that you've got to, you've got to give back as much as you take. When we got back from the war, I went back to the university and was trying to hold down a full-time job to boot. And I could see almost instantly that uh, I was going to not be able to raise my family in the manner in which I really wanted to, uh, meaning that I wanted to keep my children busy and happy and follow my feeling that you have to build a whole person. You have to build the mind and the body and the imagination and the artistic sense. You have to build all those things into young person, and I wasn't going to be able to do it in even a small university town. Why did you think you could do it here? Well, uh, not only could but did and the reason is it's just the same thing as the ranchers and farmers and people who've raised their children um, closer to nature 
One, the, the kids get a different set of values as to what's most important in life. Such as? Well, I feel that you, you can't appreciate your fellow man until you have a respect for the, all the other living things which, which have made it possible for him to be here. And without understanding those, you don't have a, a wholeness. You don't have a feeling of... Uh, most people don't realize what they belong to. They, you know, they belong to the greatest... The greatest thing that ever happened is, 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 is all these things, you see. And I know we have a numbers game problem. I know that we have supposedly too many people for food, for the basics, not just for, you know, to sp supply the soul with its, its energies. Uh, but if you go to other places in the world where people have matured in their, in their love of the land, it is possible to have more people everywhere as long as they care more about the land and have a sense of belonging to it and a sense of wanting it to survive and a sense of protecting it. And, and all I can say is that I feel right now that this country is just in its adolescence because we we just feeling our oats. We are so great in technology. We know how to run a bulldozer. We know how to destroy. But we don't know how to build and live peacefully with nature. We've always felt it as an adversary. And I think you can come out. I mean, uh, uh, you, can, <coughs> you don't have to live here, but you do have to get exposed to it. What was that you said you say to your second and third grade children? Well, I just tell them that I tell them that I'm never lonely because all these things are my friends. I know them. And because I know them, I care about them, and I don't step on them or hurt them, and I say hello when I go by. So I always tell the kids I talk with the plants and the animals and that they talk back to me. And uh, Do you tell them to say the same thing? I tell them to learn to listen. And they say, well, how, how do you... You know, what does the plant say? And I said, the plant doesn't talk like we do, but it has things to say. It tells you how to live, how to conserve energy, how to live with your neighbor, where to, where to live, and tells you all kinds of things if you learn to listen. And, and listening isn't just with your ears, it's with your eyes and the rest of your perception. And I can teach this to young children, and they can understand it. And I tell them, look, don't step on that plant because that plant can't say ouch. And one little kid tapped me on the fall of his shoulder and says, Oh, yes, it can. When you step on it, it says crunch. Now, you take that one for a better, a better, a better, uh, but you, you can't, if you believe in something, you have to take a stand. And if you do, you're bound to hurt somebody. See? Right now, they're talking about, uh, land use. And I insist that man, can't, doesn't, and shouldn't own land. He can use it, but he could, he shouldn't own it or even be allowed to use it unless he cares about it. Unless he proves he cares about it, he shouldn't be able to own it. All right, this hurts the guy who's got an investment pocketbook in a piece of land where he wants to build a big project where he's going to make lots of money because this you're interfering with his set of values. So in that in that sense... Like they asked me to come down and talk to the Lodge Owners Association about about land use problems. And we're never going to have any solution to them until we change our value systems. You know, England is experimenting now with the, with the long-term lease. That is, yeah. you can lease well, land is, for 99 what, years. This is what I live on, see. I live on a lifetime lease. I don't own that land. Mm -hmm. And when, when I leave, that land will not be fought over by my children. And will not be sold. It goes into a public trust, and my home will become some useful entity uh, other than a home. Now that's my firm feeling. Now everybody say, you know, says it's crazy. I mean, uh, you should leave your children something. I said, I'm trying to leave my children some kind of heritage of of inner strength, and it, it's nothing that a wallet or a sale price on a home will buy. And I'll do nothing but but cause friction among my children if I if I let my home become a part of my estate. So I'm trying not to leave them anything in the form of money. Anything they get from me, they're going to get before I go. Can you see the smoke from the cabin down there? I think we can get the... Uh,
Four-footed game, give us a song from this distance. Boys and girls, can we have a little song, please? Come on. That's the call of the wild, gentlemen. <laughs> Stuart Mace has spent half his life working with these huskies. Financially, it's an unprofitable avocation. The dogs cost him more than he can earn from their labors. He subsidizes his expenses by operating with his wife a small dining service and by making and selling mountain jams, jellies, and curios. But it's the way he wanted to live, and he's been rewarded many-fold, he says, by the wonders of nature and by what the Huskies have revealed to him. What, what makes a leader? Well, you know, Bill, it's, uh, it's pretty much the same whether it's two-legged or four-legged. First off, they have to be born leaders. Now, in the case of a sled dog leader, what we want is an animal that is highly aggressive and willing to be out front, except the responsibility of being out front, but also an animal who is sensitive and responsive and willing to lead like this fellow. This is Lika with the lovely blue eyes. Uh, at any rate, Lika's uh, history is typical. Uh, we singled him out at about uh, four months as having the potentialities. What did you see in him? Well, we could see that when we took the litter for a walk, he was out front. He was curious, interested. He always led the group. But yet he would listen to us and pay attention when we spoke to him, even as a puppy. But you know that you take a five-year-old child, you don't know whether they're going to be an engineer, an artist, or whatnot. You can see tendencies. So we saved him because of his tendencies. But you don't see real leadership till after you've put the dog in the team and had him do some harness work for a year, for a whole winter. And then you slowly move him up in the team to where the gray female was yesterday, working alone behind a fine leader. We call that single point. And there, a potential leader learns his lessons of the voice commands of G and Haw and the various singing that you notice we do to the dogs. What's the reward to a husky for being a leader? Uh, the reward is the same as, the, as any leader, the satisfaction of putting it all together for you. In other words, he's your foreman, and uh, you, through your voice, do the actual leading with your commands, and he takes those commands and transfers them to action. But you can see that he's not the old storybook version the fierce dog that whips the rest of the dogs in the team for leadership. And this is stupid, because if you just think about it, uh, you don't want any fighting in the team. Fighting is a disruptive factor. So you don't want a dog that's going around spoiling for a fight, looking for trouble, trying to whip the rest of the dogs in the team. And if you stop to think about it, the human leaders who try to use their physical dominance as a basis of leadership get very, get very poor results from their followers. So we find a great parallel between uh, one kind of leadership and another. What tactics the, about Lika, or what is there about Lika the other dogs will accept? Well, the do other dogs accept Lika, like many people, you, you know, some people are great followers. They, they, they do great things under proper direction and under, under guidance. And uh, most of the dogs don't want out front. They'd rather be led. They'd rather have somebody else take that responsibility like he does. Now, there are some that would be out front, but they wouldn't listen. They wouldn't pay attention to me. Notice the sensitivity and the empathy I have here. Now, Leek is a, a great love, and he gets this kind of attention when we're not in harness. But when we put that harness on him, then it's all verbal discipline between Leek and myself. But you can't have the verbal discipline until you have the empathy and the love first. This, this dog and you have something going. Yes, uh, you have to have something going between you and your leaders. I see very, very few born leaders. I see too many of the overly aggressive type and not enough of the sensitive type who are responsive, responsive to what we call our constituency and uh, who are willing to listen from behind, willing to be up in front leading, but willing to listen to what the 
what the rest of the gang is saying and what their ultimate leader is. Everybody has somebody above him. There's always one leader above another. Who has Stuart Mays? Who has Stuart Mays? Well, my leader is the challenge of the living world, of which these animals are a great big slice. When Henry David Thoreau completed his stay at Walden Pond, he wrote, I learned this at least by my experiment, that if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. He will put some things behind him, will pass an invisible boundary. New, universal, and more liberal laws will begin to establish themselves around and within him, and he will live with the license of a higher order of being. 